Good morning. Uh, welcome to sunny Manchester for a second War Poetry Vlog. Um, you're very welcome. Um, this vlog is sponsored by Skull Crusher Coffee, Death Before Decaf, Strong Tooth. Even available with CBD. No THC, of course. Mm. Delish. So, as I promised um, in the first vlog, which if you've not seen, I would suggest you start off with, because uh, it's got a couple of great poems about uh, war in, so uh, that's the whole point. Um, uh, go and uh, look at that. Uh, as I promised in that vlog, I'm going to read a um, an introduction to a book of poetry. Um, it does have snippets of poetry in it, so not, but it's written by Edmund Blunden, one of the best First World War poets from Britain. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a good introduction to the topic of the war poetry. Probably if you have the attention of Anat, this is not the vlog for you. Um, skip through to the third where we'll be cracking on with a variety of poems. Um, but I thought this was really good in second, setting the scene and discussing war poetry, um, which is a really interesting subject. Um, taught a lot in the British schools, um, classically mainly First World War. But um, So this is Edmund Blunden introducing... Um, the uh, Second World War book of Vo a book of poems by younger writers, published in forty two, um, and so it's an introduction. It's four and a bit pages, um, and they're not not that huge. But um, let's go. Uh, okay, the poetry written during the war of nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen, and inspired or modified that war, was various enough, but could be divided mainly into two classes. There was the work of the veteran authors such as Hardy, Kipling, Stephen Phillips, and some who are happily s still with us. And there was the expression of the young and often unknown writers, who were called in a general way the soldier poets. From the older men, especially at the outset, we heard characteristic utterances. As time went on, we found a deepening interest in the imparted feelings and perceptions of those on whom the intense experience had fallen most urgently. Not the least impressive thing was to discover how many of that war generation had relied upon verse as a way of reflecting intimately and independently. Far more of them practised poetry than published it themselves, or even divulged it to a friend, in some interval between the immediate tasks of active service. Parallels between the two worlds are to be drawn with reserve, but here in the third year of the New World War, 42 as I said, an anthology appears which brings out the impression made lately by other evidences. It tells us that this time, as last, war has not silenced the muses in England armed and embattled. Young men and women are responding to what is happening to themselves and to humanity at large in the terms, symbols and logic of poetry. Uh, not all of the writers assembled by Miss Ledwood and Mr Strang uh, the editors of this volume. I suppose, for the more majority of the contributors, are personally unknown to me. So not all of the writers are engaged in active service, but all represent the generation which particularly comes face to face with war. The reader who is eager to know something more of the present than he can readily find in the day's round will mark what these soldier poets have to say. Our consideration of it will perhaps be most thoughtful where their matter, impulse, declared or implied judgment varies from the mass of things circulated in time of war. For now, as at all periods, and especially when the war, when the peacetime allurements of literary reputation, social reward and the rest of vanity fare are out of season, poetry is written because its principle is one of the innocent eye. Its mood is that of seeing where the truth is, or recording things, observed, apprehended, which may open the way thither. The poets do not necessarily agree with one another, nor must they be always in one mood. This may be seen in the following pages. One writer may tell us, All nature's agents image war to me, Even that butterfly above the ditch, Flusses with sinister intent, a bee, Heavy with honey, drones at the bomber's pitch. Another finds the same infection of all things lovely. I tread the white dust of a weed bright lane alone upon time presence tranquil outmost rim, seeing the sunlight through a lens of dread while anguish makes the English landscape seem inhuman as the jungle and unreal, 
its peace. And yet to a third, a missile thrush's song is still quite a cheerful and untroubled performance. No thought of rationing or raid occurred to mar his serenade, and politicians were to him, I knew, super superfluous and grim. He honed his beak for an encore, he cared no whit about the war. There is a theme on which I believe these poets are in accord. It is one of joy, though set against a background of fiery shadow. Not long ago, the god of love was becoming something of a scarecrow, but the error has been admitted. The young poets are with Robert Burns so far as this subject is concerned. They have done with analytical approaches and consultations, and they speak clearly and universally. I know that in my mind, you stay when others pass, and entering a room, the sun is in your face. Or again, now in this quiet hour, listening to traffic, while the sun sways us and the music hovers over this tragic season, while the guns boom on over the continent, I see, amply, the simple movement of our love. As a series of thoughts upon the war in its relation to the lives and ardours of the writers, the poems do not easily yield to one definition. Possibly in time of suspense on page 11, portrays in the fullest way the new generation meeting the new breaking of nations. Neither in that nor in any of the poems is there any militarism or personal claim or study of revenge. There is not even much irony, though disenchantment finds a voice. When I was a civilian, I hoped high, dreamt my future cartwheels in the sky, almost forgot to arm myself against the border man, the inefficiency, the petty injustice and the everlasting grudges, the sacrifice is greater than I ever expected. My uh, glass recycling bin lorry is approaching, so I'm sorry if that makes a noise. Nearly at the end now, uh, so London continues. To measure the time deliberately is for some a way past disenchantment. And then we've got more pages than I thought. Yeah. Uh, so let's crack on so, with, a, with this poem extract. So now, leaning against my jar, gun in these fields and plains of Belgium, conscious of the warp and fret of spring on the hedges and forests, I accept, I accept. For there lies all our power, the power of the young and the lonely. I know that the past is lies and the present only important. I see in life service and in dying an end of loving. The way in which war saps at the treasured conquests of the human spirit is occasionally exposed. In nature class, the schoolboy's head is taught to contemplate instead of flower pot and cactus stump, a budding aluminium dump. The chances, the prospect, are touched upon, but without elaborate protest. After the band has gone, there will be music, but how many of us will there be? Be there to hear it. Through all, sparing us are the allusions to the actual ordeals of individuals. I feel the burden of their fate. The music of the verses, it may be, that conveys something more than the details in the words. Or, as to the things notified in the words, perhaps it is from the things which are not mentioned and which lie beyond the standards written that the profounder emotion is stirred. Here a brief reference to the technical side of the poems in general may be in place. We've witnessed in the years before the war a great deal of revolutionary ingenuity in the writing of poetry. We may have thought it was wasted. It had the look of being done chiefly because the inventors were determined to avoid the beaten tracks and escape the epithet literary. If we say that it was a metrical and idiomatic experiment, its transitionary character is still in our minds. But in respect of the informal and sketch-like pieces which the present volume contains, that reflection does not arise. The growth is natural and proper to the strange circumstances. All the polishing in the world would not increase, indeed would impair, the fresh and insignificant appeal of these songs of emergency. The question of their being called literary or not did not trouble their writers who had just time to leave a word with us before the column was moving off once more. All this shall pass, but this shall be again. 
Peace enters singly as she always came, when she desired eternal rest. It is her singleness impressed upon a soul, a soul, a soul, that shall in time give wisdom to the whole. In the end, as with the poetry of that other war, the striking thing about this anthology is the separate ways the poets have taken and the singleness of temper and trust which they achieve. The narrow limits which each inevitably receives in such a collection, it is not possible to consider them, as we have been enabled to consider Brooke, Sawley, F.W. Harvey, Sassoon, Owen and others whose distinct writings formed at length the poetic truth of the earlier conflict. But they, in their turn, speaking in solitariness, contribute to a sensitive and honourable interpretation of the difficult as well as deadly problem of these years. It is not the least of England's titles to eminence that so many of her sons and daughters, in the midst of the most exacting and devastating changes of fortune, can view life through the medium of poetry and gently take that which ungently came. As a member of another generation, I conceive it to be a great privilege to have been admitted thus to a private world of incident, sympathy and philosophy, which in real life might have been long hidden by shyness or want of conversational eloquence. And it seems to me that all who are anxious to explore the meaning of the present and to understand those of, on whom the future depends will find valuable enlightenment here and only in such pages as these. Edmund Blondham, 1942. So I hope you enjoyed that um, little essay, uh, this introduction to um, some 39 to 42 poems. Um, I hope you're enjoying the vlog. Um, I seem to be sticking to a between 10 and 12 minutes, which I think is, is about right for poetry. Um, uh, where should we go to next? I was thinking we'd go First World War for the third podcast and uh, go with the early poems of Rupert Brooke and Wilfred Owen. Uh, both great poets, uh, both died sadly young. Uh, okay, so until next time, keep drinking the Skull Crusher coffee. If you want to subscribe to my mailing list, it's PD Hodges, that's Papa Delta, Hotel Oscar Delta Gamma Echo Sierra at gmail.com. That's PD Hodges at gmail.com. Uh, I look forward to getting your emails and subscribe to the vlog, obviously. Um, until next time, all the best from sunny Manchester. Thanks a lot.